Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to have you. Let's pray and get right into the remaining chapters of the book of First Peter. Uh, I'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. Thank you for grace. Thank you for strength. Thank you, O oh God, for, uh, uh, Lord, equipping, O oh God, Father, that we receive from your word and your spirit. And, uh, Lord, even as we spend time in your word, we, we pray, God, uh, let your word minister to our hearts. And, Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, may your blessing rest upon each one of us, uh, Lord, the, the college, faculty, and, uh, Lord, all our families, Father. We commit all things into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we will start off with First Peter chapter 4. So we had gone to the end of chapter 3. I know there was still a question about baptism, uh, which I have not been able to find the answer to. So I'll come back to it. Now we are moving on to First Peter chapter 4. So if someone can help us read through the chapter, there are 19 verses. Uh, I'll come back and explain the same to all of us. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he, lo that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, and ab abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you, they will give an account of they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to god in the spirit verse 7 but the end of all things is at hand therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers and above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In if, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On, on their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Amen. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. I uh, really appreciate you reading it. I think you've re read several portions and uh, uh, yeah, I'm grateful to you for reading through this entire chapter as well. 
Uh, so let's now begin to look at what Peter is trying to say. We've seen so far the the general instruction is for the believer to be strong, uh, to look at the example of the Lord Jesus. And if there is any form of unjust um, suffering that the believer is going through, that the believer needs to be strong in those moments. right? And so he also spoke about submission, submission to governmental authority, submission to, um, uh, what was it? the masters and submission to in the context of marriage yesterday we talked so much about family and you know marriage relationship uh, submission of uh, the submission of the wife to the husband and uh, so he he's teaching us to still live right uh, even if there is you know injustice happening around us and uh, he's addressing the conduct of the behavior we saw in chapter 3 he said that we need to have good conduct as believers, something that, uh, you know, is, is um, there's a testimony in our conduct. And we cannot be just like the people of the world going after fleshly matters. So there is a continuation to that here in chapter four. So again, he's pointing us to Christ who suffered. And he says something like, uh, you know, he who suffered, he who has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. Excuse me. Uh, so what does this mean? He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It means that when we, we bring the flesh under subjection, then sin ceases to exist. So when do we bring the flesh under subjection? You know, Paul talks about crucify the flesh. So whenever we are obedient to God, we are bringing the flesh under subjection. Then, of course, there are there are things like prayer and fasting uh, and all in which we can engage, which will also weaken our flesh and it will help us to walk in the spirit. So one who has worked on the flesh in order to crucify it will, of course, walk in the spirit. So that's the kind of understanding that we get here. And then he goes on to saying that our life should be different from the people in the world because for the people in the world, their priorities are the things of the world. So he points out, he says, uh, uh, lusts of men, right? Uh, and, and he says, we, we should no longer live for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. That is why we are alive as believers. And he lists out many other things. He says, like the Gentiles who walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now, we know that these behaviors or um, this kind of lifestyle does not glorify God because it's about uh, fulfilling the the fleshly desires. It's about, uh, you know, uh, dishonoring God with the body and, uh, you know, all the abilities that God has given us. So he's saying there is a lifestyle which honors God and there is a lifestyle which dishonors God. And we as believers should be found should be found to have the right lifestyle also. We are saying we have faith, but also a righteous lifestyle. So hopefully we are not associated with things that are fleshly and things that are not a godly lifestyle. Now, he says when we, we do develop a godly lifestyle, uh, there is a possibility that the people of the world may uh, oppose us or they may find it strange you know why is this person now suddenly uh, you're making more time to read the bible or why is this person not hanging out with us why is this person saying no to to uh, you know uh, uh, something like a drink so there is bound to be uh, a response from the people who are watching us but we must not let that worry us. We continue in what is right. And in fact, Peter is reminding us, you see, those who are going on with, with ungodly lifestyle, there's also the giving of an account to God, uh, which will come about. 
right? And so uh, what we do by living godly is the right thing. It's just that people who are living those ungodly lives are not, uh, you know, they, they don't understand uh, the spiritual realities uh, around us and that there is an impending judgment. And so, you know, he, he continues to say that live a godly lifestyle, may your conduct also uh, really speak of the faith that you carry in your heart. And in verse 6, he says, for this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are dead. Now, this may bring a question to us. Like, how was it preached to the dead? Uh, but he continues there. He says that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to god in the spirit so how do we recognize this so when the gospel is preached to the dead you know if it is the physical dead then we have to understand that it has a reference to what jesus did he went to hades and he preached or he proclaimed that proclamation is just information or it is declaration but when it, when we say dead if it is the spiritual dead but the physically alive, which obviously are people who are unbelievers. No, they are spiritually dead, but they still uh, have the opportunity to be born again. In that situation, if they turn around, then of course, they will be able to live according to God in the spirit. So uh, it, it's, not, it's not that when the gospel is preached to the dead, anything can change because we've already seen Right? Like it is appointed for man to die once after which is judgment. So there's no question of uh, uh, redemption or salvation after a person is dead. So the Bible does not does not recommend that or it, it does not really propagate that uh, uh, that kind of a uh, teaching. So there's there's no salvation after death. The only salvation is when we are alive here on the earth. Okay, now for the end times, there is uh, some advice that he gives to the believers and he points out important practices that believers can have um, in, in order to live victorious. So he says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, what to do? End of all things is at hand, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So that shows us that having a... Uh, a powerful prayer life is helpful, particularly, you know, in, in these last days where uh, we are waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So having a strong prayer life as a believer. Then he points out having strong fellowship. So in verse 8, he says, above all things have fervent love for one another. Right. So then what does that talk about? It talks about having a right fellowship with other believers and having agape in it. We saw that yesterday also. He uses the term agape. So having the right fellowship with true love of God and uh, that way the fellowship also will be restored. He also points out be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So what does that mean? It's a saying in our relationships to carry a humble spirit and to take care you know that's what hospitality is about where we are we are making place for the other person caring for the other person uh, we are being gracious to the other person so he says make place for all these things so one was um, a prayer second was fellowship which has love, the love of God in it, uh, hospitality. So he's also calling us to have hospitality. And he points out, you know, hospitality can have grumbling associated with it because it's not easy to be gracious to people. But he says, hospitality minus the grumbling. So that's uh, helpful, you know, in, as part of our lifestyle. And he also says that we must become very purposeful. So in verse 10, he says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So he's saying that all of us as believers, God has blessed us with certain gifts. So these are the times when we must get busy in using those gifts. 
so we we know that you know uh, the enemy what does he want he wants us to be side track as long as we as believers we uh, become side track we are you know uh, living for our own pleasure or we are distracted he's he doesn't mind but when we become purposeful it will damage his kingdom he knows that so for us in these last days god is calling us to focus he's calling us to purpose and he's saying all of us have received a gift how about we get busy using the gift right as good stewards what do good stewards do we good stewards usually manage whatever has been given to them so you know if if someone has been given a, a home they probably manage it well if they've been given money they know how to make it grow so in the same way we who have been given any gift it could be an administrative ability for the kingdom it could be a teaching ability for the kingdom it can be you know any other form of ability that god has given put it to work use it okay B- uh, because that is important for us to get busy with kingdom work to be purposeful and have focus so that's also important and he is just explaining himself regarding the usage of uh, of gifts he says if anyone speaks let him speak as the oracles of god the oracles of god is like god speaking as if god was speaking so one needs to minister uh, what is in the heart of god as if god was speaking meaning don't cut anything from it and uh, you know minister it in its power and authority so that's the meaning of that so speak like that if anyone ministers let him do it with the ability which god supplies so in the fullness of the uh, capacity that god is giving us we must minister that gift okay uh, and uh, in all these things may the lord jesus be glorified because he is the one who has all the dominion even yesterday at the at the wrap of chapter 3 that's what we saw when peter is saying that everything is subject all spirits everything is subject every heavenly body uh, the angels are subject to our lord jesus christ we are under the dominion and authority of our lord jesus christ may he be glorified by the use of our gifts uh, that have been given to us by grace and even while we are living this righteous life right and so he clearly in today's chapter we saw don't live an ungodly life live a godly life especially during difficult times end times have these features of prayer and love for the community hospitality use the gifts that god has given with focus uh, and then again now he says even when we do the right thing you know there can be challenges that come our way because persecution was ari- rising up isn't it so he's just preparing the the mindset of the believer and he says you will go through persecution but have the right attitude some verse 12 he says beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy so even paul talks about it paul talks about suffering right some of the sufferings that uh, he uh, underwent for christ now the question we ask is if jesus has taken up all the suffering and he died on the cross for us what is the need for us to suffer because it's not like it's going to bring redemption the work of redemption is already complete so what is this suffering that peter is talking about he's saying partake of christ sufferings and even paul talked about it right the the sufferings of christ that he faces what are these sufferings well these sufferings are uh, relate to persecution okay this is not what we need to fulfill the work of christ or to be redeemed we don't need that however there is an element of facing trouble for our faith which whether it was the lord jesus even jesus said you will have trouble you will have trials in this world don't lose heart i have overcome the world paul peter the apostles they were talking about 
the persecution that we as believers may have to endure okay uh, and this opposition can can happen right at any any level uh, now some of us may have faced it at our uh, workplaces to some extent or you know our college or family but the bible very clearly says if if jesus went through and god's people went through there's nothing new that we are going through we just have to have the right attitude so here he says uh, rejoice right now just wonder be glad and exceeding with exceeding joy imagine you know we are going through persecution how can we have this state of mind be glad with exceeding joy so when we recognize that this is part of the faith journey it's po still possible to be glad and rejoice in these moments and uh, when we are thinking about jesus in these times you know jesus he faced reproach scripture says um, you know he was blasphemed so many things have happened but he did it to fulfill the mandate that god had for him very similarly when we go through difficulties we can still go through it knowing that at the end of it all god will be glorified and you know finally he says uh, if we if we do the wrong things and we face the consequence of that tell me how is it helpful but we are facing trouble for the right that we are doing so be joyful in the midst of those things and uh, you know he also says that uh, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god and if it begins with us first what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of god so it's basically an urging by the apostles to live right we find that all all of them we recently did the book of james where even james is talking about righteous living how to do it right this christian life uh, how to do it right because we serve a god who is holy and he wants us to be holy right in all aspects of our of our life and uh, uh, if there is unrighteousness excuse me just a moment yes so um we were saying if there is unrighteousness then there is a place for judgment now we may ask you know where do we see this if you recall in the book of acts acts 5 where the setting is more like a revival setting where the presence of god is mighty miracles are taking place what happened in the house of god Ananias and Sapphira, when there was uh, sin from their side, even sin which was not necessarily done um, uh, very publicly, in their minds, in their hearts, they wanted to deceive the Holy Spirit. So, what exactly happened? There was judgment, judgment in the house of God. right so uh, peter is reminding us of the importance of a righteous life and he's saying that god will not ignore unrighteousness and uh, we must settle that in our hearts and and if the if the judgment of god meaning if god is not going to uh, ignore unrighteousness even among believers then just think about it it's so scary to think 
that those who come under grace can face the judgment of God in this manner, how great will be the judgment of the unrighteous or the unbeliever. So to again, the emphasis is righteous life. Maintain a righteous life. Verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. So just commit yourself to God and keep doing what is right. Now let's move on to chapter 5 here where we will see a few more instructions, encouragement and a final set of um, greetings before Peter closes this epistle. And we will be able to pick up the next episode in the upcoming classes. So uh, I want to request one of us to please read. There are, again, uh, 14 verses. So who would like to read it, please? Uh, yes, uh, ju uh, just a moment, uh, Brother Lubey. Is there a question? Or? OK, uh, Jeffina has a question. So let's uh, listen to her. Yeah, I just have a few questions. Uh, first one would be, there is spirit of glory that uh, rests upon us. Uh, it's mentioned in verse 14. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So is there any difference between the both? I just want to, you know, back to the Dallas. Yes, so the spirit of glory would simply refer to the spirit of God. Okay. Spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. It's the same Holy Spirit. Uh, and the Holy Spirit is being called as the spirit of glory here. How can we say that? Now, if we go back to uh, scriptures like Psalm 24, Psalm 24 verse 8, it, it says, Who is the king of glory? Again, you know, verse 10. Who is this king of glory? It's referring to God as the king of glory, which is why we can say his spirit is a spirit of glory. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Uh, the other question, Jeffina. Yeah, this is just a doubt. The last uh, part of this uh, chapter, which talks about if the righteous one is scarcely saved. So you told you told both the verses together, seventeen uh, uh, and eighteen. But I have heard some use it as salvation, uh, like the righteous one they get saved very uh, scarcely. So it's not uh, very. You can't confidently say that. <laughs> You might get saved, some say like that. So what what is our, our view and what is our view? Yeah. So see, we let scripture interpret scripture. So if we are saying the righteous is scarcely saved, uh we we don't mean that among all who are born again, only some you know will go to heaven or some their salvation will be fulfilled because if we interpret like that that's what it means not all who are born again their salvation is for sure right but if we make a statement like that it should be supported by scripture it is not supported by scripture because if one is born again then it is by the finished work of Jesus on the cross. If we are saying it depends on our works, then what about the work of Jesus? Right. So, see, if we, if we, uh, like what you said, you've heard people say that righteous scarcely is saved. Okay, we heard a statement like that, but can we validate with scripture? We actually cannot. Because then we are questioning the finished work of Jesus on the cross. However, 
if we interpret this as yes we are fully born again we have the assurance of uh, salvation and going to heaven but if a believer walks in unrighteousness they experience judgment that is correct because we have the example of ananias and sapphira we have examples from the book of uh, hebrews we saw hebrews chapter 6 one who has tasted you know of the the uh, the life in christ and the the works of the holy spirit if they fall away then it is very difficult to bring back such a person so hebrews 6 hebrews 10 all this talks about those who have gone into unrighteousness right who have lost who could lose their salvation so then we can justify that just just the follow up question so yeah. ananias and sapphira we know that they lied and uh, so so did they lose their salvation is that what we are concluding here see there is judgment right to unrighteousness so that uh, we can comment on in the specific case of ananias and sapphira did they lose their salvation that answer uh, at least i am not able to comment on it because we don't know all the details now if it was a continuous thing which was going on and all that maybe maybe we only know about the incident so we can boldly say that they were judged for that unrighteousness yeah okay um any other questions or can we move on Okay, I'll request Brother uh, Lupega uh, to please read chapter five. The elders who are among you, I exalt. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherds and the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraints, but willingly not for dishonest gain but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears he will receive you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away likewise you young people submit yourself to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be closed with humility for god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cares for you be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him stand fast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your bro- brotherhood in the world but may the god of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen by silvanus our faithful brother as i consider him i have written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is true this is the true grace of god in which you stand see who is in babylon elect together with you greets you and so does mark my son greet one another with a kiss of love peace to you all who are in christ jesus Amen. Yes, thank you. Thank you Lubega. So <clears throat> we'll just start off um I uh, I'm we have like about 10 minutes left so we'll see how best we can cover. So we saw how he's talking about godly living and uh, 
righteous living. So now, a little bit about uh, shepherding the church. So he talks to the leaders of the church. And he's saying, I exhort you. Um, I am also a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So glory that will be revealed, it's all referring to uh, what we are going to uh, enjoy. You know, at the end of this journey, we know that there will be rewards and uh, in heaven, right? For whatever we have been through, even the sufferings, we are really going to see God uh, uh, restore us, right? For these matters. And he says, to the elders, <coughs> excuse me, the elders, he says, shepherd the flock of God. So that is the responsibility. When we look at this term shepherd, even in the understanding of the believers of that time uh, and us today, we know shepherding is to take care of uh, the sheep. And there are many different duties involved, such as protection, such as nurture, right? Uh, and uh, so, and let's say if the there are difficult times, like let's the sheep is not well or uh, there is an injury, then you know it, it's about managing that situation, caring for that sheep unto recovery. So there are many aspects of the duty of a shepherd. So when he says shepherd the flock of God, he's painting this picture of a pastor, right? A pastor who uh, needs to take care of the flock of God is God's people. Okay? So that's how Peter is uh, referring to the elders, that you need to take care of the people. We see even Paul speaking like this uh, in Acts 20. He also says, you know, these people who are bought by the blood of uh, the Lord Jesus, you need to shepherd them, you need to take good care of them. So shepherding is that kind of a care and nurture of God's people. So eldership comes with responsibility. Okay, And God makes us uh, uh, responsible and thereby we have to be accountable to this duty that he is calling us to do. So he says, flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. So oversee what? Oversee primarily... This is the spiritual life. And we know that the spiritual life of the believer is connected to many different aspects. So we can't just say, okay, we are only concerned about whether you're reading your Bible and whether you know, you're praying and that's it. No. But the godly life, the Christian life, because even here, as Peter is speaking, there are instructions for the spiritual life, things like pray, um, you know, and there are instructions for everyday life, like submission, uh, walking righteously, how to be in the workplace. So these are all connected. And as a shepherd, you know, one must be an overseer, take care of the people uh, in, in that wholeness. Okay. And now he talks about the attitude of the shepherd. What kind of an attitude should the shepherd have? He says, when we are taking care of the people, do it willingly and not by compulsion. So that simply means that we don't feel like, uh, you know, we have to do it. We don't like it, but, you know, it has to be done. So it, a sense of uh, heaviness or a burden. It's not a burden. It's a joy to serve God's people. And that's why he says, do it willingly. So the attitude of a pastor or, you know, an elder who has been entrusted with care for people must be such that they are joyful. They are very willing to take care of the people. Secondly, he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So he says, uh, when it comes to our agenda, why? Answering the question, why? Why do we want to take care of people? Why do we want to be a pastor? The answer should be that we are, uh, you know, we are concerned about their spiritual walk. We are concerned about their journey 
with the Lord. And we want them to be blessed. We want them to be strong and discipled. As compared to, he says, dishonest gain. What is dishonest gain? It, it simply means uh, that we have an ulterior motive. And what is that motive? To get from the people. You know, get. What can we get? There are so many things that people can get. People may want to get fame. People may want to get power. People may want to get money. So there are all these things that one can wa want to get because of which they want to serve people. So Peter is telling us that's not good eldership. That's not good shepherding. We need to have a heart for the people. And you know, it shouldn't be indirectly. It's actually a heart for me, but I'm taking care of the people. So that should not be the situation. So he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And then the third attitude, he says, not being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So in this, we recognize that God did not put elders in charge so that you know we can be like that uh, a strict boss who gets the work done and we have no compassion for the people so that is lord you know that lording over people but instead of that what does a good shepherd do the way the lord jesus is he is our good shepherd and scriptures tell us that he laid down his life for the sheep so a good shepherd is an example they uh, model the godly life and encourage the people to follow the godly life so that is the right kind of an elder or the right the the pastor with the correct attitude somebody who's doing it willingly somebody who's doing it eagerly and somebody who's doing it as an example and he says you know, when we when we take up our responsibility with the right heart attitude, then we are going to be applauded by the chief shepherd. Who is the chief shepherd? Now, we know there is one person who is in the office of all the fivefold ministry offices, right? So the Lord Jesus, who is also, in this case, he's called as a chief shepherd, meaning he is the ultimate pastor, who is the best pastor that we can ever learn from. It is the Lord Jesus, because scriptures tell us he is the highest ranking pastor there ever was, there ever will be, the chief shepherd. And one day he will appear. And when he does appear, what, what are we going to expect from him? He says, a crown, receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. So there is, there is a reward or a compensation for good work of shepherding. So let that be our encouragement and do the work well. Okay. So uh, I think with that, we are going to stop for today. Any questions so far? I think that's fairly straightforward. Yeah, great. All right, so let's uh, close with a word of prayer then. I just request us to, any anyone in the class to uh, please pray and close. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you thanking you for the knowledge, skills, attitude, and wisdom we've got from this lesson. Lord, also let us not only be hearers, but also doers, because since we are training and we know that by the Great Commission, we are all called to train and sh shepherd the, the flock, Lord. Let us also heed and use what Peter was talking to the universal Jews by that time and to us in particular in this generation. So let us, Lord, lead us to be good shepherds so that we cannot take advantage of those who will be hearing us, but let us put God first and always put his kingdom and into our for forwardness, Lord. I do pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> uh, amen. And uh, thank you.